My name is Adrian Salvucci. I'm speaking to you from Buenos Aires in Argentina. And I wanted to talk to you about the financial crisis. Everybody seems to be talking about the global financial crisis, but I want to show you, based on our experience in Argentina, that there is no global financial crisis. What you are suffering in the first world is an irreversible global systemic meltdown. There's no way of saving it. You might think, well, this is a little bit exaggerated, but I want to show you that based on our experience, perhaps we know better. I have here a coin which is one Argentine peso. This will buy you, well, it will hardly buy you a bus trip in downtown Buenos Aires. And yet, if I were to go to 1970, in 1970, this little coin would have purchased you Argentina four or five times after another. Why? Because since January of 1970, we have undergone four major monetary changes where they've knocked, off, they've knocked off zeros on our currency, 13 zeros to be exact. So this would be worth 10 trillion pesos from that time. And 10 trillion pesos at that time would have probably bought you Argentina three or four times over. That's inflation. Actually, that's hyperinflation. So when we hear about your inflationary concerns and everything, we've seen that, we've done that. We've been through the whole thing. We've been through inflation, hyperinflation, systemic banking meltdowns, currency changes, debt bond swaps, mega debt bond swaps, financial armoring, banking holidays, freezing of bank accounts, just about everything you can possibly imagine referring to a nation's total breakdown of its monetary banking and financial systems. So based on our experience, if you were to say, well, what should we do in the United States and in Europe? I would say, go to the bank and get your money out fast. Repeat, go to your bank and get your money out fast. And buy anything, buy an apartment, buy a house, buy a, a lot, buy anything, buy gold, buy a car. Because you see, the whole global financial system, which I have called it, or I would like to call it extreme capitalism, to differentiate from social capitalism, from constructive capitalism, is really a flawed model. And it's a flawed model basically because finance has usurped a place that does not correspond to it above the real economy. In other words, the financial system, the financial institutions are way above the real economy when it should always be the other way around. Finance, the world of money, the world of banks, the world of, uh, of monetary systems should always be subordinated to the real economy of building houses, building apartments, building airplanes, uh, manufacturing cars, manufacturing food, everything. That should always be on top with finance below it. Today is exactly the other way around. So in this tremendous fight of finance versus economics, finance has had the day. They've won and now they are totally destroying you. If anything, what is happening today with the global financial system is similar to a malignant cancerous tumor which has now gone into metastasis and in that metastasis it is threatening to destroy the entire economic body and it's going to kill it and in the course in the process commit suicide because it's going to also going to kill itself we're talking a lot about ponzi schemes we say oh bernard madoff a ponzi scheme Okay, sure, Bernard Madoff is a Ponzi scheme. But you see, the problem is, if it were only Bernard Madoff and Madoff Investments having a Ponzi scheme, it wouldn't be that bad. The whole global financial system is a Ponzi scheme. And I'm going to show you how this, this works. Actually, there are four pillars, or should I say, since we're talking about pyramid schemes, Ponzi, right, Carlo Ponzi, let's say that a pyramid, which has a base of four sides, that this global financial Ponzi pyramid also has four sides. And I'm going to describe all those four sides so that you can better understand it. First side of the global financial pyramid. Planned monetary insufficiency. The real money in every country, the United States, Argentina, Brazil, Britain, real money is the money that is issued by the state. In other words, real hot money, let's call it that way, legal tender which in the United States is a funny sort of money because it's issued by the Federal Reserve Bank and the Federal Reserve Bank is a private entity. But let's say central banks issue the real money, the dollar bills, the euros, the Argentinian pesos and so forth. 
The whole system is planned in such a way that there is never enough real money for the needs of the economy. There enters the second side of the pyramid. Since there is not sufficient public money, that is replaced or that is substituted by private money. In other words, the private banking system exerts sufficient control over the state and over the central bank, over the Federal Reserve System, so as to guarantee that it will always issue insufficient amounts of money. And in comes the private banking system saying, Mr. Individual, Mr. Corporation, Mr. Government, you need money? No problem. We'll give it to you. And that's when the banks come out with the fractional uh, reserve system and charging huge amounts of interest whereby for all the loans that they make, they make huge amounts of money. That's the second part of the pyramid, replacing real money, dollar bills, euros, pesos, with funny money, in other words, banking money, which grows at an exponential rate because it grows based on the fractional monetary system, the fractional banking system. The third side of the pyramid, do everything by debt. Consumers are always indebt indebting themselves. Do everything with a credit. Do everything with a loan. If an individual wants something, no problem. Have it on credit. If a corporation needs to build a new uh, headquarter or a new manufacturing assembly line, no problem. Do it on credit. If the government has to do something in Argentina, in the United States, no problem. Just get yourself nicely, nicely indebted with all the major private banks. And you have now a situation where, in the United States, for example, the government owes over $10 trillion, that's your debt indebtedness. Uh, corporations owe about $9 trillion. Individuals owe about another $9 trillion. My country, Argentina, is the state is indebted in over $300 billion. And our individuals are also indebted. Everybody's indebted. Everywhere in the world, individuals, corporations, states, everybody owes money. And the key question is, owes money to whom? Why is the entire planet indebted to someone? And the funny money thing is particularly, particularly dangerous because it has grown enormously. We all talk about the derivatives market. Let me give you a little bit of information that came out of the New York Times last September. 20 years ago, there was no derivatives market. In 2002, the derivatives market had grown to $102 trillion. And as of September 2008, when the crisis broke out, the derivatives market was $531 trillion. Do you realize that $531 trillion is 10 times the world's gross domestic product and 40 times the, world, the, the, the gross domestic product of the United States? Do you realize that funny money has swamped completely the real economy and that is where your problem is and the, the amounts are so huge that there's no way anybody can stop it. There's no Obama bailout plan, there's no Federal Reserve bailout plan, there's no G20 bailout plan, the, the amounts are just too big. So the third part of the pyramid, as I was saying, is everybody lives on debt. And the fourth part of the pyramid is the one that we Argentinians are experts on. And I would call it privatizing the, the, the profits, socializing losses. Because since the whole thing is a model, and a model can be predicted how it will react, we know that when this Ponzi scheme is growing, there's money all over the place, there's easy loans, easy credit, everybody makes money, everybody in, in, in quotes, and when this is growing, the whole system has, is planned in such a way that the channels for the huge profits will go to the private bankers, it will go to the private shareholders, it will go to all the people that they want to go to. When it gets to a point where this is just going to explode, as happened to you on 15 September of 2008, and the whole thing starts collapsing, a new set of channels is activated. And all the losses are socialized. Just as the profits were privatized to the people who they want to privatize them to, when the whole thing blows down and starts imploding and collapsing, that is socialized via taxpayer bailout plans or via the Federal Reserve issuing trillions of dollars of fake money, which means we all, the entire planet is paying for it. Why do we know about this more than you guys know about it? Easy. Because we've been through it. I'm 56 years old, and I've lived through three of these crises. In 1975 in Argentina, in 1989 in Argentina, where we had hyperinflation, a 10,000% inflation in one year. And in 2001 and 2002, when our whole financial and banking system collapsed and melted down, and we were practically on the verge of a civil war. Each one 
of these cycles have a different characteristic, but the results are always the same. First, all the profits were privatized, and then all the losses were socialized, and our country has become poorer and poorer and poorer. <clears throat> so we've seen it. The thing is that we've been able to see it because the cycle is very short in Argentina. It lasts between 12 and 17 years, at most. You guys haven't seen it in America and in Europe because the cycle has lasted too long. For you, the Great Depression is just a black and white photograph of people queuing up online to get, a dish, to get some soup, some nice hot soup in the winter. And maybe, if you're my age, you remember something that your granddad said about the Depression and it was hard times and so forth. You never actually lived through it. We've gone through it. And we know how it all ends. And that is where this message, in a way from Argentina, from us here, is to be generous with you and try to open your eyes that this is going to only get worse and that what we are seeing now is what I personally call Plan A. They're trying to sort it out by just putting in lots of money into it. Paulson and George Bush put a lot of money into it with Bernanke and now it's Obama, Mr. Geithner, your secretary, uh, Treasury Secretary, <coughs> and again Mr. Bernanke putting in money. But you see the problem is that you're trying to cover holes of secondary funny money with primary real money, in other words, with taxpayer money, from, which, which has to be approved by Congress, and with Federal Reserve notes, which is real money. You're trying to use real money to stop out huge secondary funny money holes, and it's just not, not going to be enough. And if you insist on that, you're just going to hyperinflate the dollar. So I think that what we're going to see is, as Plan A fails, and it will, we're going to see Plan B, which will be the same stuff plus probably a change in the U.S. dollar we'll probably see a new dollar, which is going to be gold-backed, but it won't be any gold. It will probably be what I call financial sacred gold. It will be gold that will have either a chip or a hologram or something which is absolutely fail-safe and, and, and impossible to counterfeit, which will mean that that gold, Federal Reserve gold, let's call it, will be worth $20,000, $30,000 an ounce. Uh, pagan gold, or just regular gold, will be the, the one that you can buy and, and sell in the market. A thousand, a thousand five hundred dollars an ounce. And that will have a tremendous effect on the world, because the U.S. government will be, will be able to say, okay, U.S. citizens, U.S. corporations, our allies and friends, one new dollar for one old dollar. And that would be just fine. But, for example, other parts of the world, the Muslim world, Latin America, Africa, they might just say, there's just not enough to go around, so let the market decide. And as people panic, people in my country, in Argentina, and in Africa, and in the Far East, and in, in the Middle East, will try to change their old dollars for new dollars, maybe at the rate of 2 to 1, maybe 4 to 1, maybe it will be 10, 20, 30 old dollars for every new dollar. And what will be the effect of that? That with the introduction of this new U.S. currency, you will be able to export the huge losses to definite geographies in the world. It's Latin America, Africa, the Far East, the Middle East, or even people that you just happen not to like. But I think that Plan B will also fail. And that as we saw 60 years ago, you will probably need a Plan C. And Plan C is just kicking the entire chessboard. It will mean going into a major global war, as happened in the 30s, because the United States resolved its problems by seeking to find and finding World War II, just as Germany did, because Germany had a similar problem, and they too sought a state of war, and they found it. One country lost it, Germany. The other country won, the United States, the rest of history. The rest is history. And this time we're going to see again uh, an exit strategy based on a global war. Only this time, contrary to World War II, which ended with an A-bomb over Hiroshima and an A-bomb over Nagasaki, the, this third or fourth world war, depending on how you want to number it, will probably start with nuclear armament, but nobody knows where it will end. We're still in time to do something about it, and to do something about it means that everybody in the world, especially in the United States, especially in Europe, should understand the mechanisms behind this, identify the people responsible for it, and start doing something about it. It's not just to save your own necks in the United States and in Europe. It's to save everybody's neck, not just in Argentina, but in the entire planet. Thanks a lot.